You know, Mr. Meredith has encouraged us to pray that God would pour out his spirit on his church in an even more powerful way. And actually, he's been encouraging us to do that for some years now. If you think back to our recent history, and we certainly want that. We hope for that. We're asking for that to empower, that God would empower his church to fulfill his will to do his work, even in miraculous ways. But can we prepare for it? Can you and I prepare for it today? This outpouring of God's Spirit that we're thinking about and that we yearn for and we are excited about as we contemplate the future, can we do something now to be ready? I think it's especially fitting. On the day of Pentecost, the anniversary of the pouring out of God's Spirit in 31 A.D., as Mr. Crockett said this morning, 1978 years or so, um, the outpouring of God's Spirit on the New Testament church, that we would talk about spiritual gifts today in the end time and how to prepare for them. How do we prepare for them? We don't know how God is going to use us, each one of us, perhaps, in the coming days. We just don't know. We have no idea. In some very tumultuous times, in some very confusing times, perhaps, but some very exciting times as well. That will be God's call. But whatever he wants us to do, whatever he wants you to do, me to do, whatever he is going to do through his people in the coming days, will we be ready? Can we prepare? Let's talk about that today. Let's talk about preparing for spiritual gifts. Preparing for spiritual gifts. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. We find a discussion about spiritual gifts by the Apostle Paul. We often look at this when we're talking about uh, this topic. Verse 1, 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. He said, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaks by the Spirit of God, speaking by the Spirit of God, calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people don't understand this today. You know, just speaking the words doesn't make one religious. You know, it, it's not just a magic um, mantra that you can say the words Jesus Christ and suddenly uh, you are a follower of Jesus Christ. What he's explaining is that one of the results of having the Spirit of God working in our lives is that he becomes our Lord and Master uh, when we really ask him to live in us, when we really ask him to change us and teach us and even correct us. That's the Holy Spirit that, that gives us power to change. But he goes on to explain how the Holy Spirit works in the church among different individuals, empowering different people in different ways. Notice verse 4. He said, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Uh, now there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So then he begins to talk about the different ways that Spirit works in his church. Verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom. You know, one of the things that we notice as we begin going down the list is these things are not all exclusive to the ministry. Now, some obviously do apply more, um, but not all. For example, the word of wisdom. How many times have we benefited from the word of wisdom, from another brother or sister? How important is it that we can say the right thing at the right time in a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Is that a gift of the Spirit? 
to be able to have wisdom, to be able to encourage one another when we need it, to say the right thing at the right time. That's a powerful thing in a profound way that we can ask God to lead us, to be able to help, to go to our brother, or encourage someone else to go to their brother. Sometimes that's the word of wisdom. Or perhaps to say, you know, I've been through that. I understand what you're going through. And you can do it. And in fact, this is how I handled that situation. That can be a word of wisdom. Or perhaps, you know, maybe you need to talk to a minister. Sometimes that's the best word of wisdom. But that's a a spiritual gift. That's something that he says he can empower his people. That's a profound thing if we are using that and if he has done that. Let's not minimize how important the word of wisdom might be. What about verse uh, 8 going on? He says, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit. You know, knowledge is a gift from God as well, he says. We certainly need the Holy Spirit to open our minds to the truth. And we learn through the church, through the leadership, through our teachers. But unless we have God's Spirit working in us, we can't understand the things that we are learning. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. How much do we appreciate that knowledge is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? And we can ask God for growth in that. Verse 9, and to another faith by the same Spirit. You know, faith is not either or. It's not on or off. We sometimes have different degrees of faith, don't we? And sometimes different ones of us might have more faith in one situation and less faith in another and vice versa. Faith is a gift to the Holy Spirit as well. Are we asking God to pour out on His church, on us individually, the gift of of faith. You know, it might be something we need more and more of in the future. We have some pretty scary scenarios, even from uh, individuals out in the world who aren't a part of uh, what we're doing. Here is one uh, report from an investor talking about hyperinflation. You all, uh, I'm sure you have uh, seen reports like this. This was published July. Um, uh, wait a minute. I think uh, uh, the, some of the statistics were pe- published last July, but he said this, the U.S. economy will enter hyperinflation approaching the levels in Zimbabwe because the Federal Reserve will be reluctant to raise interest rates, investor Mark Faber said. Prices may increase at rates close to Zimbabwe's gains, Faber said in an interview with Bloomberg Television in Hong Kong. I believe this was uh, in just a few weeks ago. Zimbabwe's inflation rate reached 231 million percent last July, the last annual rate published by the statistics office. This is from Bloomberg.com. 231 million percent. I think Dr. Scott Winnell mentioned yesterday they basically don't have a currency anymore. Now, brethren, our inflation rate over the past uh, number of years has bumped around 1-2%, 3-4%, back and forth. Can you imagine? I, I don't think we can imagine uh, what would happen in that kind of scenario. We have some scary possibilities in the future. Are we going to need the gift of faith even more? That's one of the spiritual gifts we talk about on the day of Pentecost. Another one, verse 9, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit. Now, this is one we talk about a lot, that we think about a lot, that we need a lot, and we're going to need a lot more in the future as well. But you know, it's even though it's primarily through the ministry, we might say, but how important are all of our prayers as well? The gift of healing. Are we just asking for God to pour out His Spirit on the church so that others can heal people? Or are we fervently praying for others' healing? God can work through our our prayers um, in many different ways. Mr. Gorgonio Deguia 
a very close friend in the Philippines and fellow minister we got to know some years ago uh, when we were living there. He would tell us the story of when he was growing up and uh, actually when, his, uh, uh, when he had a small family and one of his daughters was very sick uh, unto death and very uh, critical situation. He was Catholic, but in the Philippines that didn't mean you go to church. Uh, you just were brought up Catholic. He was a fisherman, and one night he went out onto the shore, under the stars by the water, and he kneeled down, and he said, God, I've heard about you. I've heard that if, if that there was someone named Jesus Christ who went around healing people, and if you are the same person that I read about, please heal my daughter. And if you do that, I will follow you the rest of my life. And she was healed. He wasn't even in the church at that time. Certainly wasn't a minister. You know, he got the reputation around town that when he prays for someone, they get healed. People were coming to him from all over the village asking to pray for different people. And they were healed in powerful ways. You know, we can't limit God. The gifts of healing. That's one of those things mentioned here. The list goes on, verse 10, To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All are gifts of the Spirit. We, we just don't know how these things could be perhaps used in the future. You know, the gifts of tongues would be an incredible asset to the work, wouldn't it, at some point? We wouldn't have to translate into languages. I mean, just imagine the, the enormous impact if what happened on the day of Pentecost would happen again. In the interpretation of tongues... And the speaking of tongues. The point is, we just don't know. I have to tell you a story, speaking of tongues, um, that we, we can't speak in tongues yet now. <clears throat> Sometimes we wish we could or could understand. The other day, when I was visiting with Mr. Pierre one time, uh, I picked him up at his office, and um, he had just been on the phone with someone and who was a French speaker. So he was talking in French, and he was kind of in tune with French speaking. He got in the car, and he, he looked at me, and he started talking. And I knew he was talking to me, but I couldn't make out a single word. And, you know, the, the, I'm sure the look on his face, was, uh, the look on my face to him was just utter befuddlement, you know, uh, because he was just speaking in French, and I thought, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> we need the interpretation of tongues, don't we? I don't know French. Verse 11, But one of the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Ultimately, it's God's will, isn't it? He's the one who's going to decide how this might be used, who might be used, in what way, when, etc., Right? It's His will to accomplish His work. point is, we, we can prepare. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We review what, what happened on the day of Pentecost. In verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, you know, some have said this shows they were driving foreign cars back then. Sorry. It was a big accord, though. I don't know. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other, other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We've talked about this already. We've looked at this already. 
uh, yesterday, today, as we think about the day of Pentecost. But you know what? Would that must have been an awesome event? That must have been an incredible thing to witness that, to be there, and realize what was happening, and to see that. It must have been something they would never, ever forget. To hear the sounds, to see the cloven tongues of fire, and then to be explained to them what was going on while that they were witnesses to the fulfillment of this prophecy in Joel, as we heard. Verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to the men of Judea, And all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. These are not drunken, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I'll show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. You know, this may be, and there's some research that shows this may be, that he was referring, that, that this was referring partly to when the darkness came, when Jesus uh, was crucified, um, certain signs in the heaven as well, a, a lunar eclipse, something like that. Now, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, you know, so there were certain things that they may have correlated with what they had witnessed there. But you know, it also seems to apply to the future, doesn't it? Because the prophecy in Joel is talking about before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So might there be a fulfillment in some way of these things at the end time? Just before Christ's return, we know the heavenly signs are going to happen. Are these going to be used in some way? We, we, we expect so. We think so. We don't know exactly how. But the pattern is there. And we're praying that God would use the church in whatever way He wills, right? But how do we prepare? What can we do? It's interesting to go back to the book of 1 Corinthians because we were read, reading about some of the spiritual gifts there. But that's not the only place that Paul talked about spiritual gifts. Let's go back to the first chapter. <clears throat> Actually, in the very beginning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. He says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Jesus Christ, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift. You ever notice that? So that you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the first issues that the Apostle Paul brought up in the very beginning of the book of 1 Corinthians was his desire that God's people would come short in no gift. In other words, that God would use his people, in whatever way he will. Now, what does that mean? <clears throat> you know, then we start looking at the context of the whole book. Think of all the things he talked about. Think of all the things that he told the church in Corinth. 
Why was he telling them that? Why was he giving them instruction? So that they would come short in no gift. So God would be able to use them in whatever way he willed. Let's look at some of the things that he talked about. And brethren, as we are looking into the future, as we are wanting to prepare ourselves as tools that God can use in his work in whatever way he wills, let's make sure that we are doing everything we can to prepare so that we come short in no gift. What are the, some advice that, that Paul gives in preparing? Number one, number one, work for unity. Work for unity. That's the first thing that Paul launched, launched into. After talking about spiritual gifts and healings and miracles and powerful things, he said just a few verses later, but first, you've got to work together. Let's read about it. Verse 10. He says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now look at the contrast. He started by saying, I want you to have every spiritual gift that God can give, that, 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 that he can use you to, to perform. But then he brought it down, down to the mundane. But you know what he said? There are contentions among you. There are arguments sometimes. There are fightings. Kind of sounds like a parent, doesn't it? Stop fighting, right? Any of you parents, you feel like you're kind of a broken record after a while? That's not very exciting. No, we want to talk about spiritual gifts. Those are exciting. It's not very exciting talking about unity and not arguing and working together and being a team, right? And yet Paul was saying, if we want spiritual gifts, that's where we start. We've got to work together. Isn't it? How many times do we hear about working together and being cooperative and being unified? You know, we might even get bored about it. We might get tired of hearing about it. But you know, especially at the end of an age, in a Laodicean age, in an age when organizations and groups and governments are, are constantly being splintered and, and, and flung apart and opinions uh, multiply exponentially and thousands of, opin of opinions take people in thousands of different directions. How important is it that God's people who are preparing for doing what He wants with spiritual gifts have unity? Very important. Let's go over to chapter 3 and verse 1. Chapter 3 And verse 1, we are living in an age of disunity, aren't we? Disunity. And, and we have to swim upstream to actually work together as a team. Because the mantra in our culture today is you don't have to work with anybody. Just be yourself. You don't have to cooperate with anybody. You don't have to subject your self-interest. You don't have to do anything that's uncomfortable. You don't have to work for a common goal with others and, 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 and um, sometimes subject your own self-interest. Well, we, we see that we have to. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with meat, for you were not yet able to bear it. No, not even now are you able, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you jealousy and strife, are you not carnal? And do you not walk after the manner of men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Ministers through whom you believed, and each of as the Lord gave to him. I planted, Apollos watered. 
but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives the increase. Brethren, our society, our culture breeds competition, doesn't it? And strife. And yet, if we are to do the work, if we are to be ready for whatever God wants us to do in the future, especially if if we want Him to give us more power, right? Miracle-working power. We've got to be able to work together, don't we? We've got to be able to work as a team. Because unity and teamwork, it's becoming a lost art. Are we working for unity in the church? Are we working for unity in our families? Are we working for unity in our marriages? Is it something we value? Is it something we're seeking for, working for? What about our work environment? The world will not help us develop this trait, right? We're not going to get a lot of applause from the world. But it's necessary if we really want to change the world and if we want spiritual gifts. So on this day of Pentecost, let's make sure we're valuing and we're working for unity. We find another value at the end of chapter 1 in 1 Corinthians that Paul brought out, number 2, and that is glorify God and not ourselves. Glorify God, not ourselves. Again, you know, hey, I thought I thought Paul was going to talk about exciting things like healing people and calling down fire from heaven and doing miraculous things. Now he's talking about being humble. That's not very exciting. That doesn't sound like fun. Well, that's what he did. Notice in... 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has called, has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Ouch. He's talking about us. You know that those same people that he said in chapter 12 uh, that God is going to work through you in these spiritual gifts and you'll be able to do this and do that and do this and do that. And then in chapter 1 he says, I want you to come short in no gift. Now he says, you know, look who we are. We're the foolish of the world. We're the weak of the world. As we heard yesterday, humility is a critical starting point. May not be quite as exciting as, you know, doing other things, spiritual gifts, but it's the starting point. That's the point. Wouldn't real, true, deep humility be the starting point for God giving real power to His people? even in a miraculous way. Verse 28. He says, In the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So we don't glory in ourselves; We glory in the Lord. Now, why is this so important? That we glory in the Lord and not in ourselves. Well, think for a moment. We're talking about miracles being performed by human beings. 
Brethren, what are the things that puff us up right now? What are the little things, the tiny, the stupid little things that we sometimes get puffed up about now? What do you think would happen if we had miracle working power with, with carnal nature? You know, I mean, really, if we could go around and poof, you're healed. Poof, you're healed. You're healed. You're healed. What would that do to our head? What would that do to our vanity, our ego? Unless we are truly, deeply, profoundly humble. Are we being tested on that now? You know, if we are, rejoice. If you've been humbled this week, shout hooray! Because God is preparing you and me for greater things. Perhaps being able to have greater power. If we can handle the power, the little power he's given us now. But we've got to be humble. You know, it's interesting, uh, when we look at the book of Acts, what the apostles were able to do, uh, what Peter was able to do, the powerful statements, the, the healings, the miracles, the bold messages. But brethren, what had happened to him just a few days before? Remember the story Jesus Christ had told his disciples that he would be delivered to the Gentiles and he would be delivered up to death and he would be killed. And Peter said, nope, I won't allow it. I'll protect you. I won't let them get you. And then when he was arrested and Peter took out his sword, he went for the head, but he got the ear. And Christ said, no, 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 put your sword away. Christ was taken into custody. The disciples fled. Apparently, Peter fled. Then he followed to see what would happen. Notice, let's read it. Luke chapter 22 and verse 54. Luke chapter 22. How important is it that God has absolutely smashed our vanity and our pride and our ego before we can be used in powerful ways. Well, look at the story here, Luke chapter 22. Remember the example? They seized him, verse 54, and they led him away and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the court and had sat down together, Peter sat in the midst of them. And a certain maid, seeing him as he sat in the light of the fire and looking steadfastly upon him, said, This man also was with him. I I recognize that guy. But he denied, saying, Woman, I know him not. Remember, Christ had predicted. He said, Peter, you say this now, but you're going to deny me three times before the night's over. He said, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after the space of about a half, uh, one hour, another confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I know not what you say. And he immediately, while he yet spoke, the cock crew, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Apparently, somehow, they, they, their eyes met. How small did Peter feel at that moment? It says he went, he, he went out and wept bitterly. He was humiliated for what he had done because he couldn't do what he professed he was going to be able to do. And yet only a few weeks later, on the day of Pentecost... He stood up, and things started happening in miraculous ways. Brethren, do you think for a moment that Peter ever doubted where that power came from? He would have to live with that bitter memory of denying Christ. 
and being humbled in that way. Brethren, when we are humbled, be thankful. Be thankful. Because God is preparing us. He has to humble us before he can give us more ability and more power to be used in his work. He has to know that we'll glorify him and not ourselves. It's interesting, why did Paul start off this discussion about spiritual gifts with working as a team and also a warning against getting puffed up? Well, because it had already happened. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You know, the issue had already become one of the gifts of the Spirit becoming a matter of pride, a matter of self interest. It's the matter of speaking in tongues. We find a discussion about speaking in tongues. Apparently this gift, which had been given to some, had over time become misapplied. And it it had been kind of become a status symbol um, in the church. And the whole purpose had been forgotten. We we pick up the story in chapter 14 and verse 1. He says, pursue love And desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy, or inspired speaking. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. In other words, if there's no one to interpret There's no point in speaking in tongues, right? Uh, The gift is useless. It has no point. And yet it seems, again, that to some it had become kind of a badge of honor. That's what Paul was trying to get at. Verse 12. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Verse 18. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. You know, if, if there's no interpreter, then it's pointless. It's just showing off, right? It's just self-serving. He says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. In the law it's written, with men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people. And yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say you are out of your mind? You know, He was making the point, this is going to look ridiculous if all of you are speaking in tongues, but there's no purpose for it. You see what was happening? Brethren, why are we seeking spiritual gifts? Is it so we can go, wow, look what God is doing through me? Is it so we can feel like God is blessing our church and not others? Is it so we can pat ourselves on the back? We have to be very careful. God has to know our motivation is not to flatter ourselves, brethren, but rather to simply do His will. And if that involves spiritual gifts, He'll do it. But we have to make sure that we get out of the way. That we work together. And we have humility. What else did Paul address in the book? Number three, seek for personal purity. Seek for personal purity. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Again, in the context of preparing for spiritual gifts, what are some of the issues he talked about? Well, one was a morality issue. We're familiar with the example of the fornicator 
cast out. We find that first Corinthians chapter five and verse one. He says, it is commonly reported that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife and you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now again, what in the world does this have to do with spiritual gifts? I thought he was going to talk about healing and and calling down fire from heaven and doing powerful things. You see what he's doing? He's, he's saying, yes, I'm going to give you these things to do, but you've got to start at the bottom. You've got to start at the foundation. You've got to make sure that you work together. You've got to make sure that you're humble, and you've got to make sure that you're clean. Brethren, if we are praying for, as we are praying for spiritual gifts for the church, let's pray also for purity and that we are clean in the church. And let's make sure we ourselves are striving for that. That's really the basics. Notice in chapter 6 and verse 9. If we want to be used in powerful ways, we've got to make sure that we are in tune with the Spirit. Chapter 6 and verse 9, he says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he explains where forgiveness fits in, verse 11. But such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Verse 15, Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What, don't you know that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, says he, shall be one flesh, for but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Verse 18, flee fornication. Now again, what does this have to do with spiritual gifts? Everything. Everything. It has to do with submitting to the Holy Spirit. And that's where spiritual gifts come from, right? What about us? Are we clean in the most personal, intimate part of our life? You know, as we approach the end of this age, we have to swim upstream, don't we? To do it right. Because the floodgates are opening. And they're getting more and more open all the time. Anything goes out there. You know that. I don't have to tell you what's going on. But the people of God, those who want to yield themselves to God for His work, they will be different. They'll be keeping themselves from the filth and the nastiness that is out there in the world. How do we prepare for spiritual gifts to be poured out on His church? One is by being clean and by praying for purity for the whole church. Let's do that. Verse, verse 18, he says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is without the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. What, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, we've got to choose at some point whether we're going to follow the flesh or whether we're going to follow the Spirit. We can't have it both ways. 
We can't, if we expect to be used by God with spiritual gifts, we can't be doing the things that He forbids. We can't have one foot in the church and one foot dabbling in the world, in the uncleanness of the world. Brethren, who knows if God will give us the opportunity, some of us sitting right here, to have incredible spiritual gifts at the end. What a privilege that would be. But are we preparing with the basics now? That's the point. Are we doing the mundane and boring things every day? The character building things every day, brick by brick every day. And are we praying for that for the whole church? What's next on Paul's list? Number four. Number four, he says, work for a healthy and balanced home life. Well, that's the words I put into it. You won't find that exact phrase in Corinthians. Let's turn over to chapter 7 and verse 1. Do we have a healthy and balanced home life? Believe it or not, that's what Paul addresses next. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. This in particular is addressed to married couples. He says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife has not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband has not power of his own body, but the wife. Now what in the world does this have to do with spiritual gifts? You know, the conjugal relationship between a husband and wife. How do you make the connection at all between speaking in tongues, healing the sick, the powerful signs of the day of Pentecost. With this, he's talking about what is our home life like. Now, this is pretty frank. I mean, he's talking about the, you know, the physical relationship between a husband and wife. As an aside, isn't it interesting, you know, that we might, this might make us a little uncomfortable. I mean, you know, this is uh, very frank. Isn't it interesting, movies and TV shows today, whenever they show two people that are kind of teasing each other, kind of flirting, kind of making eyes at each other, and eventually it leads to a physical relationship, isn't it interesting, they're always single. They're never married. You know, it's not exciting if they're married. In fact, it wouldn't really make much of a story if you had a husband and wife in a movie and they were kind of flirting with each other. It would seem kind of weird, you know, Uh, to Hollywood. It just wouldn't make sense. You see how it's upside down? It's all turned around wrong way. Paul was saying, look, married couples need to make sure they're affectionate, they're loving, they're giving, they're sharing. In marriage, they need to treat each other with respect. They need to exercise God's spirit in the home. Not just in regard to sex, but in the whole home atmosphere, how they treat one another. He was getting down to the very basics of home life, our most personal, private life. Now, he's leading up to spiritual gifts, but he's saying if you want power, if you want to be a part of this work, that has incredible potential and God may use in powerful ways, you've got to get it right at home. You've got to be taking care of business at home. Because that's where everything hangs out, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. Our children, our spouse, they see us as no one else does. They see us when we're up. They see us when we're down. They see us when we're patient. They see us when we're not patient. They see us when we've got it all together. They see us when we have lost it all, right? When we're frazzled. 
Brethren, he's, he's addressing the home life because that's where we have to work. That's where we need to use the Holy Spirit. Perhaps that's where we should be using it the most and working the most because we can often overlook it. If we want God to pour out His Spirit on us as a church, individually, collectively, in His spiritual gifts, let's, let's also pray that He would pour out His Spirit on our homes, on our marriages, on our personal lives, that we would work on what we need to work on at home. What if our mate is not converted? Uh, we're off the hook then, right? This doesn't apply. Well... Actually, he addresses that. Notice in verse 13. He says, And the woman which has a husband that believes not, and if he is pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. Look at that. Incredible. Even if, you know, if we are converted, if we have the Holy Spirit, even if our mate is not converted... He's saying when we use God's Spirit, when we apply it at home, when we apply these principles, the things we learn from sermons, from articles, from study of God's Word, it's going to help us relate to our unconverted mate. It's going to help us to become a better husband or wife. And that unconverted mate who is sanctified is benefited, even if they never Come into the truth. We've got to work on it at home. What if you're not married? Then certainly you're off the hook, right? Oh, sorry, not even that. <clears throat> Verse 32, he addresses the unmarried. I'm going to read it in the Living Bible because I think it's helps to uh, explain it a little better. He says, verse 32, In all you do, I want you to be free from worry. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please Him, but a married man can't do that so well. He has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. You know, he, He's not against marriage. He's just explaining that there are some advantages to being single. That, uh, you know, spiritually, as far as time spent, seeking God. His interests are divided. It's the same with a girl who marries. She faces the same problem. A girl who is not married is anxious to please the Lord in all she is and does. But a married woman must consider other things such as housekeeping and the likes and dislikes of her husband. I'm saying this to help you, not to try to keep you from marrying. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few other things as possible to distract your attention from Him. In other words, Paul was saying, whatever situation we're in at home, we've got to make sure that we're serving God. Married, both converted, married, one converted, the other unconverted, married, single. Sorry, I mean, at home, single. We've got to apply it at home. Think about your life, brethren. How would you like to improve it your home life are there things you'd like to change are there ways that you'd like to apply the holy spirit more powerfully if we want the gifts of the holy spirit if we want god to pour out his spirit on the church and on us individually are we bearing the fruits of his spirit already in our homes let's be honest <clears throat> notice galatians chapter 5 and verse 19 Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. I'm going to read it in the Living Bible again. Which list in chapter 5 and verse 19 describes our home life? And be honest, you don't have to tell your neighbor, you don't have to tell me, you don't have to tell anybody. But don't fool yourself. Or try to fool yourself. Verse 19, when you follow your own wrong inclinations, your lives will produce these evil results. Impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, hatred, fighting, jealousy, anger, constant effort to get the best for yourself. 
complaints and criticisms, the feeling that everyone else is wrong except those in your own little group. This is the Living Bible. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and all that sort of thing. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we might add, will not be given the gifts of the Spirit. It goes without saying, right? Now here's the other side. A home directed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 22, But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, it will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Which describes our home? How much self-control is on our home? Or is everyone always flying off the handle? How much patience is in our home? Or is everyone always getting jittery and irritated and testy? How much peace is in our homes? Or do we argue a lot? Do we raise our voices at each other? Are things tense? The point is, if we want God to pour out His Spirit and grant spiritual gifts, let's start at home. Teamwork, humility, purity, and a balanced and healthy home life. Let's move on to the next one. Number five. Number five. <clears throat> what does Paul talk about next? He really gets personal now. He talks about our money. Faithfully tithe. Faithfully tithe. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 1. You know, he's, gotten, he's gone from preaching to meddling, I think, at this point, isn't he? It's pretty personal. When you look at all the issues he brings up in this book, but think about it. This was all in the context of not coming short in a spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 1, he says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not you my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are you in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and drink? Now, he was defending his apostleship and his right to use the tithes. Even though he didn't use the tithes, he was explaining, I have a right to use the tithes because I'm laboring in, in, in the word. Uh, verse 9, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and, and Cephas or Peter? Or do I only and Barnabas have not the power to forbear working? Who goes to warfare any time at his own charge? Who plants a vineyard and eats not the fruit thereof? Or who feeds a flock and eats not the milk of the flock? Do I say these things as a man? Or says not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Is God only concerned about oxen? Yeah, what's, what's the point about that statute? Or was he explaining that God provided for a way to support those who labor in the word? Verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. That's the principle. Now, what was the real issue here? You know, it may not have been that the Corinthians had to be convinced of the necessity of tithing, it appears that they were. They had no problem with tithing as a law, as a statute. Maybe it's just they didn't want to tithe to him, you know. We, we have no problem with tithing, but we're just not going to tithe to you, Paul, you know. They didn't want him to use the tithes. You know, we can be touched by this issue today. If we faithfully tithe, we understand that one, once... We've got to have faith that God is guiding the organization, right? Our job is to give the tithes, and after that, 
we have trust and faith that, that God is backing the organization and is going to use it in the right way. Do we put a, you know, put a tracer on every penny that we put in the, put in the basket and then we kind of make sure as it goes through the different um, machinations of the organization that we can track every penny? No, we've done our job when we have tithed, right? And we have faith that God will do his after that. Well, how does tithing prepare us for spiritual gifts? Well, brethren, would God really pour out his spirit on a group of people who weren't convinced that God's spirit was leading that organization enough to tithe? It all ties together, doesn't it? Our tithing, our giving offerings, it shows where our heart is. These are nuts and bolts issues. Basic issues. Not quite as dramatic and exciting as spiritual gifts, but we've got to get these right if we want to have more opportunity. So are we prepared? Are we preparing? Number six, number six, we must eat only from the Lord's table. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 14. How do we prepare for spiritual gifts? Well, we have to discern the Lord's table and the world's table. And we've got to reject the world. We've got to eat at, feed from the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 14. He says, Therefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. You know, when we partake of the Passover, the bread and the wine, we're, we're symbolically partaking of the body of Christ. We show who we belong to, right? We show who we're connected to, and that's Jesus Christ. We show what table we're eating at. Verse 18, Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. What do I say then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. And we're we're familiar with the controversy they were having at that time, the meat offered to idols. Uh, The reason this was such a problem was the act of worship was connected with eating. The animal was sacrificed, the meat was eaten, it was connected to worship. Verse 21. Then Paul explains, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Now, what he's, was he only talking about meat offered to idols? You know, later on, he explained the meat is nothing in itself. The real issue was coming out of the world, wasn't it? The real issue was at some point we've got to choose which culture we're going to reflect. Is it going to be God's culture? Or is it going to be this world's culture that we're coming out of? Brethren, are we in tune with God's culture, with His ways of doing things? Is that a value we have? He goes on to explain it even further in the next chapter. Chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 11 and verse verse 1. He says, Be you followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances or traditions as I delivered them to you. Interesting. Paul was saying that the church, even by that time, was, was developing a separate culture was developing a a, a different way of looking at things, 
a different way of doing things, even by that time. Traditions, customs, uh, in, in trying to come out of the world and trying to be, be separate and not partaking of the table of demons. And he gives an example, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaved. It doesn't appear that he was talking about a head covering, but rather about hair length. Notice verse 13. He says, Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Interesting. Of all the picky, intrusive, detail things that the church could get into, he brought up, of all things, hair length. Now, brethren, what... What was Paul explaining? Well, he was just explaining that a man's hair and a woman's hair should be different. There should be a distinguishable quality. But he was showing that there are things about God's way of life. There may not be a thus saith the Lord. There may not be a commandment about it. But we should be applying God's Spirit in principles, in our daily life, even in traditions. Isn't it interesting that in the context of preparing for spiritual gifts, Paul talked about something as specific as hair length. Are the traditions of the church important? And that's the question. Are the ways of doing things important? You know, as we come into God's church, we look around, we see people. We see how things are done. We see how they dress, how they handle themselves, what they do or don't do, what they say or don't say. We see how they apply principles in the Bible where there may not be a commandment. And as Mr. Meredith has said, when we're new, these things sometimes take a little time to get adjusted to. But we learn the norms and the customs and the traditions of the church, and we learn to conform to those things. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because we're coming out of the world where anything goes, right? We're coming out of the world of countercultures and subcultures, and we have to learn a new culture, and that's God's culture. When you first came into God's church, what traditions did you learn? When you looked around at other people, what did you notice about them? What things did you start doing that were different? Now again, not on the level of commandments and, and um, those things, but just the way they did things. Brethren, the traditions give us stability. Paul was explaining that in preparing for spiritual gifts. He's saying we shouldn't discount their importance. While they don't carry the weight of the commandments, they're important enough to mention in the context of preparing for spiritual gifts. We're coming out of the world. We're learning to eat at the Lord's table. Along the way, let's reject, let's, let's be in tune with God's Spirit, and let's reject the things of the world. And let's take on God's culture. All these things, humility, teamwork, purity, home life, faithful tithing, being in, church with, being in tune with church traditions, they're important. Paul was talking about them. What's the seventh and final way we'll talk about? Notice in chapter 13. Actually, chapter 12 and verse 27. Chapter 12 and verse 27. <clears throat> He 
He says, Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Paul was saying it's good to want to have the spiritual gifts. It's good to have the desire to be want to be a tool in God's hands. <clears throat> he says, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And Dr. Scott Winnell read this yesterday. And we're going to conclude by going through a little bit here. Chapter 13. What is the underpinning of all the spiritual gifts? Well, it's love, isn't it? Chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. Brethren, if we are not developing love, if we are not asking God to pour out a heart and a spirit to love, we're not going to be ready for other spiritual gifts. We're not going to know how to apply them. Verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Charity and love envies not. It's really summing up everything we've covered up to now. In the family, at home, love suffers long. Love is willing to be patient to not respond in kind. Are we kind to each other at home? Are we patient? Is there tenderness and warmth and genuine feeling and, and peace? Verse 4. Going on, he says, Love vaunts not itself, is not puffed up. Are we truly humble? And are we asking God to humble us? Are we continually asking Him to correct us? In gentleness... We can't take it, you know, full bore. We need a little at a time. But are we asking Him to humble us? That's how we get ready for spiritual gifts. Verse 5, does not behave itself unseemly. Are we taking on God's culture? Or are we hanging out with and hanging on to the world's culture? Are we taking on the culture of purity or are we clinging to a culture of lust and selfishness? We've got to ask ourselves some tough questions. Verse 5. Does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not its own, is not easily provoked. You know, are we working for teamwork, for unity? Or are we just in it for ourselves? Are we focused on the needs of others? Is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Really kind of an astounding I think, point that Paul puts this explanation of love right in the middle of a book about spiritual gifts. Saying that he wants us to not come short of any spiritual gift, but we have to grow in love to be ready for that. Brethren, as we pray for God's Spirit to be poured out, as we are here on the day of Pentecost, as we think about that day 1,978 years ago when it was poured out in such a miraculous way, and as we think about what might happen in the future and how God might use people, and we pray us, we might be fitting tools in His hands. Brethren, what are the things that we can do to get ready right now? Are we doing those things? 
because the whole book of Corinthians talks about some of those. It's interesting. Why is love so important? Dr. Winnell touched on this a little bit yesterday. You know, there's going to become a time when the spiritual gifts will have done their job and their usefulness is over. He explains that. He says, verse 8, whether there are prophecies, they shall fail, or in other words, they'll come to pass and then they'll be done. Whether there are tongues, they shall cease. You know, at some point, it won't be an issue about speaking in tongues, right? When we all speak the same tongue. Whether there is knowledge, it shall vanish away. You know, there's going to be some day when our minds are going to be open to so much knowledge when we have the fullness of God's Spirit that the little bit of knowledge we have now, I mean, it's going to be like, you know, we were riding a tricycle, right? Think back to, you know, your little kids are riding tricycles and it looks so exciting to them, right? You know, someday we're going to look back at our life like that. The knowledge that we thought was so was was so astounding. I mean, it's going to blow that away when we learn the fullness. Verse 9, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Paul is telling us, if we want to be a part of the team that God is going to use, we've got to do the same. And got to take it as his advice. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abides faith, hope, and charity, or love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. You know, we have a great destiny. We have a great future. And on this day of Pentecost, as we think about what happened so many years ago and the awesome power that was given to the church, we we anticipate it's going to happen again. Brethren, let's be a part of that work that's preparing for it. Let's pray that God would empower His people to accomplish His will. But let's also pray that God would guide us to prepare for that day. Every single one of us in this room, around the world, everyone by following the lead of His Holy Spirit in our lives now. Paul shows some ways that we can do that. Let's make sure we're doing that perhaps more profoundly than we ever have before.